Hello, good morning, good evening, and good afternoon. And wherever you are in this wide, wonderful, beautiful world that we live in, you are very welcome to the Global Sales Leader Podcast. Every week, I speak to some phenomenal people from around the globe that are experts in what they do in the areas of psychology, coaching, neuroscience, uh, uh, technology, uh, body language, linguistics, uh, you name it. There's lots and lots of different areas. I like to be pivoting slightly different and I always want to give something back. Uh, and it's all about giving golden nuggets forward so the people that listen to my wonderful podcast get something out. I am the sales relationship coach and it is in sales and in life and in business. If you can get that relationship, that rapport, that trust, that credibility up front with your clients and when you're training and development like we 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 do the royal we in front of us myself with Stella and you get that impact with other people and it really helps to get that connection so today I've got a wonderful guest um Stella Collins and uh I found out about Stella a couple of years ago on LinkedIn learning so thank you for that and always had it in the back of my mind just uh gonna have to reach out to Stella and I did, and then uh, I got her book, which um, I, it's the area that I'm fascinated in, Neuroscience for Learning and Development. I really got a lot out of it, and I'm going to get a lot more out of it today because I'm actually speaking to the author. So, Stella, you are very welcome. Thank you very much. Um, look, I always want to find out uh, the, what got you into L&D and your fascination with it. What, what happened along the way? <laughs> so I never wanted to be in L&D. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> my, uh, all my family were teachers, so I never wanted to be in learning. It always seemed to me like it was a very tricky job. Um, but I did do psychology at university, which I absolutely loved. Yeah. Um, and did a master's in human communication, which I also thought was really fascinating. And then kind of during my master's, I ended up doing a project on computer aids for people with speech disabilities. And suddenly realised that, you know, digital tech was really interesting. And this is you know, a long time ago when digital tech was nowhere near as sophisticated as it is now. Um, which made me think, well, that seems like quite an interesting role to be in. So I went into, I went into IT. I was a programmer, I was a coder, I was an analyst, uh, supervised people, uh, did system support. You know, I did the whole, the whole tranche of jobs. As part of that, I ended up doing some work in um, what was called expert systems at the time. So kind of early AI in terms mm. of learning. And um, also did one of the first e-learning programs in the UK, uh, along with a, a friend who was doing a, a master's at uh, Edinburgh University. So kind of, you know, that was interesting, but I still wasn't really interested in being a trainer. Because all, like my experience for IT training was dreadful because you went along for two weeks and somebody talked at you and maybe you got to do some exercises, but you were always paired up and the other person was much worse than they were always. Yeah. So they, they did the exercise and I just sat there. When I got back to work, then I think, well, I'm going to get the book out and then I'm going to start again and actually work out what I'm supposed to have learned. Um, having said that, I accidentally got a job that was technical support and training manager. But well, I just ignored the training manager part. I don't want to do that. Yeah. Um, but uh, took on a very inspirational trainer who kind of made me begin to recognize actually learning is really interesting. IT training is really boring, but learning is really interesting. And of course, that brought my psychology back. And I then met a very inspirational group of people who used accelerated learning and could really see then how you could make what had up to that time been very boring, how you could actually make it engaging, interesting, fun, and actually start to change the papers and, and kind of went from there then. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a challenge really in um, training people because it's, it's a bit of a frustration as well if you're going into a client, but they're doing it as a tick box rather than actually wanting to embed the learning and wanting to make a difference rather than going, well, I need to do this and let's just do it. And there's no real thought behind that. 
Uh, and and you and you, I know you're nodding your head because you, you can <laughs> see it as well. So how do you get around that? Because um, I'm always looking for different ways and different approaches. But I think it may be into the introductory conversation that you have with the client or the clients to make that difference. I think for me it was about because I actually understood, you know, having done psychology and then having then got some practical experience from the belt, and I then did some, you know, some training in kind of the L&D world. Um, I think for me, it was just when I went into a client, there was just this expectation that I can, I can deliver what you want. Some of them would be interested in how I would deliver it, and some of them were just kind of like, okay, we'll just deliver it, that's fine. Um, and I never compromised in terms of, you know, if they said, but can you do... You know, a five hour program and squash it into two hours. No, of course I can't. If, if that's what you want, then go and talk to somebody else. So I never compromised in terms of you know, using the principles that I know, using the methodology that I know works. Mm. So I think it was kind of a case, of, I mean, maybe it was you know, ignorance of other options. I don't know, but I, I just never compromised. That was the way we did If you want to work with Stella, as I was saying, Stella then, you can manage to work with Stella left. That's the way we work. We can we can get results and we will get results, but that means this is the way it works. Yeah. No, I, I totally concur with that because it has to be done. Like I know you have to meet in the in in find out what they do and all of that, but that's fine. But it's understanding the way that we can impact your organization and how the longevity of what's uh, being done. And that probably leads us into a little bit of behavior and neuroscience and how people learn and learning styles because i'm fascinated by that as well oh, oh yes <laughs> yeah yeah don't mention learning styles okay tell There's me more absolutely no evidence at all for learning styles so people learn different things in different ways but we do not have learning styles okay. all the evidence shows you know if you just put in myth busting learning styles into google you'll find it there is no evidence for it whatsoever. So how, how do you get around that then? Because I'm curious, uh, because of the stuff, some of the stuff I've read, like auditory kinesthetic and uh, 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 seeing and everything else like that. But how, 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 tell me how you get around that and what you do. Okay, so tell, tell me, if you decide you're an auditory learner, yeah. um, so you learn by listening to podcasts and maybe, maybe you know, talking to people, how are you going to learn to ride a bike? True. You have to see it, yeah. You don't have to see it. In order to ride a bike, you have, you have to, to ride a bike. Yeah. You could watch as many videos as you wanted. You have to ride a bike. Yeah, of course. It depends what you're learning as to which kind of mode works for what you're learning. And, you know, in work, we don't want people just to learn knowledge. We want them to be able to behave differently. We want them to do things differently. We want them to actually... Yeah, I mean, it's always, for me, it's always about doing. We want people to do their jobs. And you cannot do your job if all you've ever done is watch a video. Yeah. You can't do your job if you just listen to podcasts. I agree. I totally concur with that. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, learning styles, absolutely. It's just a myth. And sadly, it's a very persistent myth. Yeah. But it's a myth that's out there. And, and there is even some evidence that shows that if you try and teach two learning styles, you can actually damage the learning really how, how do you mean how do you mean damage because you're, you're trying to teach people everything through you know with your, your visual learners i'm going to only show you videos i'm going to only do visual reading we, it's very important to bring in our senses hugely important to bring in yeah. our senses because sensory information is part of how we build our memories so and our, our visual sense is the biggest sort of, the biggest part of our brain we have in, in terms of sensory stuff so that's really important. That is totally different to I am a visual or kinesthetic learner, or even um, you know I used to I, I used to know Peter Honey. He was a very very good man. He was a very nice man. But you know Honey and Monk with learning stuff again. There's no evidence that you are a pragmatist or uh, I can't even remember the different the different start parts of it now. But you know people learn depending on what they're trying to learn. There are different strategies for learning it. Then. I must admit. Um... I was I had a puncture on my bike the other day and I forgot how to take my wheel off. And I went onto YouTube and I spent an hour like fiddling around with my bike, just couldn't do it. Went onto YouTube, how to, and I went like that, and I went had to practically do it. 
then it was done within minutes. So uh-huh. I sort of learned by visual and auditory, but then it had to be kinesthetic and actually had to do it. So that does make sense. So you can, yes, you can obviously get information through you know any of these means, yeah. sensory means. We need information in order to help us learn, whether that's an experience or whether it's you know some facts or whether it is how you change your bike. But if you had only watched the video, your bike would still have a flat tire. Yeah. Yep, uh, absolutely. So for me, learning is about doing, learning is about changing how you behave, how you react to things, how you respond to things. That's what learning is. So tell me this, in um, just as an example, um, there was uh, some low performing salespeople in an organization and the organization recognized it and go, well, we need to do something with them. How can we get them from low performing just to, dip them up and go okay they're now they're going to make an impact uh what what sort of things would you do in that scenario well first we'll find out what the problem is of course yeah. is it them yep or is it the fact that they've got a really awful manager who just doesn't allow them to perform? is there something in the organizational structure that doesn't enable them to be able to perform so first of all, find out what the problem is. It may not be a learn, but they, they might be hugely motivated, but it's just the system is preventing them from performing well. So first of all, identify the problem. Once you have identified the problem, then you can decide, is this a is this training issue? Is this a, a corporate issue? Is this you know, a systemic issue somewhere in the organization? Mm-hmm. You know, have, have they got the will? Is a really good question. So are they willing to improve? Yeah, and, and have we given them this? Have we equipped them with the skills? But not just have we equipped them with the information. Have we equipped them with the skills to sell? Yeah, a, a few years ago, no, last year, last year, no, no, it was three years ago. Now, I, I went on a sales training course with you know an expert, so called, yep. who talked to us and a lot of very good ideas. But I think we had one opportunity to practice selling, and in a kind of role play opportunity. Yeah, now yeah. I love that sort of thing. So yeah. I, just, you know, I was in there and I was role playing. But a lot of the other people were just horribly embarrassed by it and learned nothing from it. And surprise, surprise, the sales in that company I was doing work with didn't improve. Yeah. Well that's the challenge though, isn't it? And that's always the challenge is uh, how can we embed the learning, especially like there's so many people out there in sales, one of the biggest industries out there. I think everyone's a salesperson in, in one shape and form. And Sarah, I think you are as well. Yeah. Uh, inversely, you probably don't know it, but you're still uh, working with companies. You're still working with people and you're still getting an idea over to... I, I am a salesperson in our company, so I do do sales. <laughs> yes, exactly. But I think every, every trainer has an element of, of sales in them because you're having to sell an idea. In the first place, you're having to sell an idea. Yeah. So the process of learning is, A, you need people to be motivated. And if they're not motivated, it doesn't matter what else you do. It doesn't matter how fantastic the tech, it doesn't matter how fantastic the content. If they don't know why they need to change their behavior, why they need to learn this stuff, you, and, and that motivation has to be maintained throughout a learning journey. Yeah. So the process of somebody changing their skills, their habits, their behaviors, even their attitudes, is lengthy. And sometimes, you know, sometimes it's hard work. So yeah. you, need, you need to be motivated throughout the process. I think it, it's uh, like a public to Brené Brown, fixed and open mindset and all of that sort of stuff. But it, it is true. If you're passionate about wanting to change the way that you're doing something, something's not working in you. I know for me, a few years back, before I got into training, there was something not working with me. I'd been working in sales and marketing for many years, but I just went to a stumbling block. And then I had to learn and I had to reinvent myself because then I had the hunger and first to just change something. I know I knew something was wrong, but I had to go out there and learn. And I learned loads of stuff, uh, public speaking and Toastmasters and all of that sort of stuff. But a lot of NLP and psychology and all that. And then I just found the passion. But for a learner, because I'm, I'm a learner and I always think I'm a learner. If you're sitting in a course, I've got to be passionate about wanting to do something and something is not working in me, I need to change. You do, and I think as a you know, as a trainer facilitator, you need to help people find what is it that will that will get because you know, people do get sent on courses, it, it will always happen. Yep. Um, 
for, as, as if you're designing delivering good learning, one of the things is you understand the organizational objectives. Yeah. You understand what does the organization need the people they're training to do? How do they want them to feel whilst they do it? You know, you could you could have your salespeople following all the rules, but if they're following it with a miserable kind of attitude, they're not going to make any sales with them supervising people. Um, so yeah, so you, you need that kind of motivation, you need them to have an experience, you need them to have some grounding, some guidance, some structure, some knowledge, you know, it can be frameworks, it can be tools, it can be models. They need something to work with. They need an opportunity to explore and experiment with what they're doing and kind of make sense for themselves. So how does this work in my job? Yeah. Um, they need a real, whatever you're doing has to be, has to be sticky has to be memorable because if it's not memorable then you've just wasted your time again and then finally people really need an opportunity well, not finally towards the end people need an opportunity to to practice to, to demonstrate that they are learning in a safe environment to start with so that it feels okay but then actually you need an opportunity to practice in your job you know how do you practice in your job how do you get support in your job and you do need support in you know you need a manager or a peer or somebody to say Actually, you're doing a good job there and keep going. And you know, I can see you're learning, I can see you're making progress. That's hugely, hugely important. Yeah. And then finally, we need to make sure that people are able to um, you know, to use space repetition and space practice to continue that learning. Because if all you do is you go on a training course and you come back and maybe try it once at work. That's it. It's that continuous process, really. And it's continuous, it's a it's a long, iterative, continuous process. Yeah. And you will always keep, you know, if, if you're learning well, you will always keep developing. And if it's in a good organisation, personally, this is one of my things anyway. So whether there is uh, a, an online uh, uh, application that can continue where you left off in the real world on the training, uh, the, the practical stuff, and also maybe a coach to help develop that a little bit further and that's where i always think that people get it wrong they go training course tick done everyone feels really really good excited and they go back into the office and then they get bogged down with the same old stuff and nothing ever happens so one of the things i'm very passionate about is that we use evidence-based learning so you've already said you know learning styles and i've dismissed that i'm sorry i'm going to sadly dismiss your nlp as well There's very little evidence for most nlp it's some of it is based on some good psychology, some of those some of those not. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, it's always about checking that are the models we're using, are they well researched? Have they been proven in practice? Are they um, you know based in sound science? Mm -hmm. um, and that's hugely important because otherwise you're wasting potentially wasting a lot of time, energy and money, yours and maybe your clients or your learners, you know, doing things that might work or they might not work. But actually, we know a lot about the science of learning. We do know what works. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the reasons I'm so passionate about it, because when we know what works, we can do what works. And you know, we're building a platform right now that actually uses the same process of learning to support that learning process. So that it doesn't always have to, doesn't always necessarily have to be a person who supports you. Technology can support you. We're all used to having tech support yeah. us in many ways now. So how can we use tech? But that tech has to be designed with that evidence base behind it, you know, knowing yeah. what is what is the science of learning, how does learning really happen for people. I, I was working, I have been working with a company recently, I'm a hobby horse here, a company recently got some very exciting tech. And they're not quite, they're kind of, they're searching for something to do with this tech. Yeah, because yeah. they haven't embedded it in a learning process. They've got lots of great features, but they're not quite sure why, why are their customers not coming back year after year, because their customers, it's not doing what they need. Yeah, yeah. It's not, it's not doing the job. It needs to be doing something else. There's lots of other pieces of tech like Gong and similar technology out there that um, in a, I would say it's more of a coaching environment, which, uh, analyzes the language that you use and picks it out and go well 
when I coach you back, uh, I can look at the language and whether the buying signals and it pick out the buying signals from the client and the customer and all of that. So that's interesting, but it's, again, it's got to be applied correctly. And that's, that's starting to use AI, isn't it, in terms of looking at and language processing and things, which, which you know, again, is it really vital. But you've got to know why you're using that AI. Are you using it because you can use AI? Because you can. Or yeah. are you using it because it, it actually is part of the process of learning? Is it somewhere in that journey of learning? And I think, A, a lot of people don't define learning in the first place. They don't think, are we learning knowledge, skills, attitude, behavior? You know, what is it we're actually learning? And all those things, you know, the process, the process in your brain is very similar. It's, it's mm. the process of you know, rewiring networks um, and, and building new strong networks is why repetition is so important, for instance. But repetition at the right time, just repeating over and over again, and just um, just recognizing, you know, one of the, the things that Children particularly, but I think adults too, you know, when you're doing exams, you're yeah. revising for your exam, you look through and you go, yeah, yeah, I know all that, because you recognise it. But when you have to recall it, that's a totally different it is. activity. It is. Uh, and a, there's a lot of narratives that you have to do. I, I, I learned about uh, how you can impact uh, memory learning techniques based around about that by using a narrative uh, I know Darren Brown uses that to remember decks of cards, but he's using the same sort of techniques as if we say the queen means the radiator, uh, the king means the floorboard or whatever it might be. I still haven't quite mastered it. A friend of mine is a memory champion and he taught me it. So I went, excellent. Uh, how can I apply it? And what do I need to do with that? But so I'm fascinated with all of those areas and, um, how we can use those learning techniques to help others remember and to make sure. And again, uh, when we started, I was really fascinated by the area of stickiness. How can we make this even more sticky, maybe using technology around us, maybe using everything that we can for that end user, because it's all about them, not about us. It's not about our little tick boxes. It's not about, uh, how uh, how our graphs are looking afterwards and this that and the other is how well are they performing after the job yeah after the first month the first six months the first year i read your article thank you stella and it's all <laughs> sticking in my head and i remembered it because the reason i remembered it it's uh something which i want to learn so how how do we apply that stella it's like anything new uh you take it away you learn it and you relearn it and you learn it and then you apply it but you everything's got to be done in an authentic uh human way that it builds rapport in the right way and trust and connection and what we do as uh humans and what we do as trainers and coaches and all of that it's it's to see i always think it's all always seen about from your point of view and it is proper empathetic communication really understanding the other person and their needs and in sales it's all about that it's all about that connection asking lots of questions about them and their business and maybe the pain points uh, everything like that and when we come in as as trainers and again we still need to find the pain points of the business and where we can help them grow and where we can come up because we want to come out good with a good reputation and, and you asked about sticky, and I think, I mean, there's lots of things that we talk about in terms of sticky, but I think one of the things that's really important is sticky is because it's the learner who does the work, because it's their brain who has to change, not the trainers. And it's, you know, it's really common, and, you know, experts do it, new trainers do it, you know, to think, well, I've got to, I've got to give them everything I know. But actually, they're not ready for everything you know, you're just giving problems of overload if you do that. Yeah. The learner has to do the work. The person who is going to learn this new, whatever it is they're learning, even if it's knowledge, yeah. but more particularly if it's skill, they have to do the work. They're the ones that have to change all that wiring in their brains and their bodies. Almost everything we do, our brains and bodies are completely connected. So making it relevant is hugely important, getting them to do the work and making sure that this, this learning journey goes across time. It's not just, you know, we can't. We 
we still can't, and it's going to be a long time until we can just magically implant knowledge. And that will still only be knowledge for a long time. Probably we can implant knowledge. I don't know how long it is. It's on a clock or we'll some of that. Um, but, you know, the ability to change a skill or a habit, it's, it's, it's hard physical work. It is, yeah. Because they, uh, it's been distilled. Habits, uh, obviously, maybe anchor it against something else. But like, I hear lots of reports. I know it's not twenty-one days to make a habit, and they the, some of the research that does go say it's up to sixty-six days to. And what you're learning. I know you're changing. I know you, and you've got to want to change. It's like yeah. smoking, isn't it? Uh, New Year's Eve rev resolutions just don't work because. New, January the 1st, you're a little bit hungover and everything else like that. And you, uh, I've never smoked in my life, but it's that sort of thing. They do it and then after a month they give up because they really haven't embedded it. They haven't got the hunger the first to actually apply it to their lives. And this is all about what we're doing is applying it to what we do in business. And, and, and you know, with smoking and things like that, context is hugely important. What are the cues? And I know Darren Brown is actually very good on this. You know, what are the cues? that are leading you to behave in a particular way. Yeah. So, you know, if you have had a, a learning experience, we're up to an amp, you go on a course and you come back to work and the manager says, well, get on with the job. There's nothing in the environment that's telling you, actually now you need to do something different. And, you know, it's going to be hard work. It's going to feel like you're going to have to make a change. If you don't get the, the, the cue of support that says, great, you know, you've made a little change, that's fantastic, keep going. Here's the next change. Mm. So this 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 follow-on, this space repetition, this space practice, this support in the flow of work is, is so important. And, and so many, you know, I'm not saying nobody knows about it, but yeah, lots of people know about it, but there are a lot of people who don't know about it. Yeah. Sadly, sadly, training is still an occupation you can just go into if you're an expert and, and in organizations it happens all the time that you're the expert you tell everybody else you teach them but without that skill of teaching without that skill of understanding how learning works you're you're just you just you know i've seen it so many times i'm sure you have uh, but i i think it's also the passion of what you want to do as well and how you deliver it and it is your communication skills your tone your tonality your body language and all of that sort of stuff but then it's the application of what you're doing to make sure that they go go ahead and learn by discussions and games and gamification or whatever it might be. Lots of different things you can do. And you, I think it's just test, test, test and see what works and have a look around. Does that work? Or maybe that doesn't work here. Maybe it work. Uh, let's try something different. So testing has a slightly dirty, you know, kind of dirty feel. You know, why would we give people tests? But actually testing yourself Yep. or being tested is actually a really good way to check you know how well are you learn and if it's handled well not you know when you fail but uh but actually oh I, i've developed a little bit here and i need to still work on that you know testing can be hugely motivating yeah when it's done well yeah and, and like i say you know you have to keep that. the motivation piece is so important throughout but always thinking about how are we going to help people actually transfer new knowledge new skills new attitudes new behaviors how are we going to get them to use those in the workplace ah uh, this has been fab I, I i could probably talk another hour or so on this <laughs> subject with yourself because I, I i i really haven't got the tip of the i've just got the tip of the iceberg but all wonderful things have to come to a close and uh, maybe i'll get you back on because there's so much more i need to learn from yourself stella so how can people find out more about you so uh, they can go to my, uh, our website. So that's uh, www.stellarlabs.eu. Um, it's an EU website that's written in, in uh, English, still in English. Um, they can look me up on Twitter, at Stella Collins, where you can find LinkedIn, Stella Collins on LinkedIn, so you can find me very easily. Um, yeah. And LinkedIn Learning. And LinkedIn Learning too. Yes, they can find me on LinkedIn Learning too. And that's how I found you on LinkedIn Learning because I learned some really good, uh, wonderful things from you, which I've stolen and made it my own. So thank you very much for that. Uh, we also we also run training programs. So if people are interested, you know, we run train the trainer training programs in evidence based approaches to learning. And, and like I say, you know, this platform we've developed 
that's now in there with customers. So the, the plan with it, so right now it's supporting learners, the plan is it will actually support uh, designers and developers and subject matter experts to design using the principle of language based learning. Awesome. That I uh, um, I'll probably have a, a sneak look at that as well because I'm fascinated. Thank you very much again. Uh, you've listened to the Global Sales Leader podcast. I'm your host. Every week we speak to phenomenal people around the globe that does something slightly different, but it's all about laying the foundations of learning something from every podcast that we do. And today with Stella Collins. So thank you so much. Thank you, Jason.